Heads up, friends. The unofficial Shopify podcast is made by indie entrepreneurs for indie entrepreneurs and may contain material not suitable for all audiences, like swearing or economics. Listener discretion is advised. For e-commerce businesses, revenue is just part of the story. With mounting ad costs and narrow margins, knowing your genuine profit and contribution margin is more important than ever. This is where Store Hero comes into play. By harmonizing your sales, marketing, and cost data, Store Hero delivers a comprehensive snapshot of your true profitability down to each order. Knowing that, ramping up your ad spend amidst market volatility becomes a clear-cut, data-driven decision, all with a platform that values profit-first metrics. And for you, they have a special offer. Mention the unofficial Shopify podcast when you get a demo of Store Hero to get a free profitability audit for 2024. Ready to navigate the e-com game with a profit-focused compass? Store Hero's unified dashboard gives you that clarity and the confidence you need. Discover profit-first e-commerce at storehero.ai. Day. We're discussing a man who has managed to figure out the secret sauce, right? The recipe. In, from 2019 to now, he's grown a brand, a dropshipping business, at a, a big competitive vertical from zero to 30 million. And this just flatly blew my mind when I talked to him, when I was introduced to him. And so I, I want to share this story with you. I want to, I want to hear about this. We're going to unpack how in the heck is that possible is that sustainable how does one go from zero to 30 and certainly what is growing a team like when you're scaling at that that speed i have trouble conceptualizing numbers that big but all right the the gentleman joining us today is sean reyes from shock surplus and that's that's what we're going to hear about how sean reyes shock surplus went zero to 30 million selling automotive parts through drop shipping. This is the unofficial Shopify podcast. I'm your host, Kurt Elster. Check nasty. Sean Reyes, welcome. How's it going? And uh, just just a little bit of a, a, a check there. It's about three to 30 million, but- uh, Three you, you to know, 30, zero, okay. You know, zero to 30 is more fun, but you did 10X it either way. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride the past uh, few years. Um, so it's been a, a big challenge. Um, you know, we we were building in the background, uh, very undercover in uh, in our industry, and then when we started, kind of in um, COVID, it we it really put us on the map. We really were started being everywhere. Um, you know, during COVID, we were pretty primed to start uh, spending on Facebook um, in in a big way, and I think that contributed a, a, a huge amount to our growth. So um, it, it's been a wild ride. Um, the team has grown tr quite a bit. Um, more money, more problems. So we, all right. So it's in 2019, you're doing three and a half million. Today we're doing 30 million. So four years. When did this business start? We start, I started back in 2012, um, officially got the website um, done in 2013, but we were starting on eBay uh, for many years. And then we would moved over to Amazon for a couple of years. And um, during a, a failure of a custom uh, website build out is when we really moved over to Shopify. Um, you know, we, we put in about a year and a half with a, a custom, with a dev team and they failed to deliver. And, um, you know, we were at SEMA, uh, met with the owner, expressed extreme disappointment and um, had a terrible Black Friday. Um, speaking of Black Fridays, but that was, a ter that was like our 2016, 2017 Black Friday was the worst. Uh, and then me and my, um, my good friend who works with me, we uh, decided to build uh, a site on Shopify, you know, stock theme, got it built and uh, selling within a couple months. And um, kind of the rest is history. And that was in 2019 or tw when did you move to Shopify? Um, I think we were selling it on 20, 2018. January of 2018 was, uh, was the official Shopify start. And why Shopify, right? Because you were starting from 
trying to go custom. So really, mm-hmm. it, it, you could probably figure out any platform. What was it that made you go with Shopify? Uh, we were uh, previously on big commerce, and you, you know how how it goes in tech, where you know the, the thing that comes out the following decade is always just much faster. You know, I knew I think it was you know knowing Shopify is built on Rails, Ruby on Rails, the the new tech stack. You just know everything is just going to be better um, than the previous generation of platforms like um, Big Commerce, which is what I had experience with, and so. Just knowing that, I was like, I know I can get my whole catalog and everything I'm doing up on this and selling within a month. And um, all the themes, the speed, all of that stuff really, it made it really a no brainer. I didn't even consider anything else at that point. Um, So yeah, kind of a no brainer for me. And looking on Google, I'm able to see uh, you have 78,000 pages indexed in Google. (laughs) So I'm assuming, like, obviously there's SEO, there's landing pages, but I, the bulk of that has to be your catalog. Your catalog must it be is. huge. And that's not including yeah. variant SKUs. That's that's correct. Yeah. We probably have over 150,000, including variant SKUs. Um, so it is a big catalog. And what we uh, how we actually got started and how we kind of did a little bit of a market arbitrage was um, bundling, uh, bundling shocks for our customers. A lot of these, a lot of these, um, customers, they didn't, they don't want to hunt for part numbers in a catalog, um, and then piece, you know, two front parts and two rear parts on eBay or Amazon and doing that whole kind of circus. So we bundled front and rears for a specialized lift kit or a specialized lowering kit for these, you know, highly modified vehicles. And that's how we gained a lot of traction and how we were kind of able to uh, fly under the radar for minimum advertised price policies that so many of these big global brands have. So yeah, we, people uh, we who cheated. aren't <laughs> in aftermarket automotive don't understand the how deceptively simple what you just said was. It really it isn't nearly as simple as it sounds, you know, because you've got, let's say you've got a hundred thousand products, but they fit a variety of vehicles. And so you're carrying effectively dozens of the same thing, but only one is the right one for that customer. And so you have to filter it down and get them to the right part. But even if you do get them to the one right part, you're fighting with everybody, competing with everybody else who's selling the same thing. And you're, beholden to the manufacturer who sets a minimum advertised price policy map where you then they're like, all right, this is the price floor. This is where everyone sells at. And so it levels the playing field. Now, what do you do? You have to find some value add. And in your case, what you did was clever. You took it a step further and you said, okay, hey, I'm going to guess it's like popular vehicles. You're like, all right, we got, we know there's a whole cohort of dudes with 92 to 96 Honda Civics who need new shocks and also probably have a lowered vehicle. And they don't want to order the wrong thing. It's like buying clothes. What do I do if this doesn't fit? Will this fit me? With car parts, it's like that problem just gets exacerbated. Where now, ah, how do I know that this is the right part for my specific vehicle and my scenario where I have gone and modified the vehicle? And so you figure that out. And then by bundling it together, we get around map because no one product has the price on it, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, typically the uh, the rules are uh, as long as the part number isn't in the title, um, you can uh, you can basically price it wherever you want. You know, all the all the companies have their own little special legal um, stuff. But um, you know, we've talked to heads of these brands, and they're like, "What you guys are doing is okay." Uh, lawyers say it's okay, so here here we are. And so you you were able to identify this hole in the market. Um, and you know, part of it's identifying it. The other part of it is like actually implementing it. It's harder yeah. than it sounds based on just the sheer number of fitments and then like deciding on the right one and then deciding on which packages or which products are going to go into each package. Was it trial and error? Was it gut feeling? How do you go about this? It was it was really gut feeling. Um, backing up a little bit. I, I, I'm not even a gearhead. I'm not a, I don't. Um, I didn't grow up around cars or anything. I grew up around computers, building computers, um, and playing video games, but I got started with my, my stepdad and he brought me into his little, um, kind of suspension, uh, four by four shop. And I immediately recognized that like he was already doing a little small, he was doing drop shipping on a very minuscule basis. And I was like, wait a second, 
what's this drop shipping thing? You can, you can, we can, we don't have to touch the parts at all and just ship them to our eBay customers. And he's like, yep. And so once I figured that out, I was like, well, all these, you know, all of these lifted trucks all over the place, we were, we were already answering those questions all the time on eBay. And I was like, you know, it was that, that, um, that market was just screaming for help. Um, on top of that, shock absorbers are also a very technical uh, product that is, they're hard to understand just by, you don't, you can't understand them just by looking at them. And so you have to rely on manufacturers to tell you like what they do. Um, and even then, you know, it's biased by the manufacturer, right? So combining both of these problems, I'm just like, oh man, I can just, I literally in 2012, I was like, I could just, I'm just you know, stay up every single night, <clears throat> make brand new listings on eBay. And the next, by the next day, like they were selling. And so it was like just creating this flywheel of popular applications, different lift kits. Um, uh, you know, it, it was like a, basically just was really easy to get started because the, the need for the help was so, so obvious. It still kind of is. Um, we get flooded every day with questions on, do I run this or that, this or that for my truck? And, you know, it's, we still have a long ways to go on making that information easily accessible and easily digestible. You know, that's, that's, that's my whole goal still is just mass education <laughs> in this uh, category. So you had, it sounds like you had a stepdad who had an off-road shop and he's, he was starting to sell on eBay. So you saw the potential there and then you got into it with selling on a marketplace, which is such a great way to test the waters on an idea, right? You don't have to build a brand. You can start with an account on a marketplace and it's really dependent on product market fit on the quality of the listing and especially eBay in the early days. And so you're doing, and then like once you get that figured out, now we're testing packages for individual vehicles based on the knowledge that you're putting together, based on the questions you're getting nonstop from people. And you like, yeah, when you start to see a consistent question around like, well, this fit my car and the answer is no, and you see that, you know, five, six times, you go, okay, there's an unmet demand. If there's these specific people asking about this specific vehicle, clever. Yeah. And you know, our, you've been in the, you've, you've got some experience in the automotive aftermarket space, but like I, the, the tech adoption and, um, well, technology adoption and retail trends and just that, the, uh, that whole thing is we're so far behind in general as a art industry versus general retail. Um, so education being education focused is still new for a lot of people in this category and in this space, um, where like people, you know, have been educating in general retail at the higher end for a decade now. So, um, you know, seeing, seeing what's happening in general retail and general DTC, um, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, ahead of the game in, in the automotive space in that regard. Talk to me when you say education, why you think education is important and you're ahead on it. Mm -hmm. What do we mean specifically? Are we talking about SEO content? We're, I mean, we're talking about legitimate education. Um, and I don't even educate for SEO purposes. Um, we, we educate on, on YouTube, uh, uh, through like real experience, you know, so my staff and myself, uh, we go through various vehicles. We use the exact products we're, we're, we're selling. Um, and we, we do just massive comparison tests, massive comparison reviews. Um, and like what, what Alex Hermosi says, which is, um, when, when you have, when you've done the thing, you have the conviction that what you're saying is true. Cause you're not really, you're not on borrowed knowledge. How many, how many retailers, how many people at small automotive shops are all on borrowed knowledge? They're just using manufacturers, um, descriptions and all of this stuff to sell the product or sell the product based on their margin. You know, we're, we're doing it out of a genuine need for, or, or a genuine position of like, what's best for the customer. You know, our, our motto is like, we're not trying to tell you what to run. We're trying to help you figure out what to run. And so by doing that, we're testing all the things that we can on a given application. That's why we, that's why we're a lot deeper on certain like Toyota applications or Ram applications or some of these vehicles where we have so much experience because our staff has ran it. Numerous people from the company have driven the staff vehicles on all sorts of different products. And so when we, we go really, really deep and that kind of helps us just build authority in the space and be the guys to, to come to when people you know, need a recommendation. 
yeah, scrolling through your YouTube channel, kind of issue, you said, uh, we don't tell you what to run. You have a video entitled Shark Surplus. We don't tell you what to run. It is only 30 <laughs> seconds long. It has 400,000 views. We, we, that, we, that was a previously, um, a paid promotion thing that were like, um, at about 200,000, I made it public and I was like, well, this is our message. So, um, might as well just make it public, but it's, it's picked up a lot of views still. So, um, yeah. And the number of videos you have and like the breadth of it. And it's so, it, it's very product focused. Like, you know, uh, coil over comparison. And so it's like, here's five different brands. And in 20 minutes, you're going to compare them. 26,000 views. And another one, like here's three different brands. King versus Fox versus Icon. Uh, 100,000 views. And it just keeps going like that. And I love you do a series, Shocks in 60 Seconds. You highlight a single product in one minute. And those will just be like 5, 10, 20,000 views. Yeah, we've, um, one of the things we really discovered in the past couple of years is manufactured virality. Um, and, you know, in the automotive space, it's like, Ford versus Chevy or Dodge versus a Toyota, whatever the case may be, the same thing exists in our little, um, our little category of, of, of parts where that King Fox icon video, I knew it was going to blow up before we even published it because, um, you know, just the fanboys from each, <laughs> each brand following is like, no, this is better. No, this is better. Or a lot of the people just getting into the overlanding space, you're familiar with with all of that with your experience at Overlander. Um, but just so many people entering the space of um, high performance shock absorbers, which was not a thing before them at all. So they're, they're brand new. They're really trying to understand what these big names are all about. And so, um, you know, we take that perspective of like talking to the noobs. This is what it means. There's no one best thing. It's what's, you know, it's what's best for you. And I think a lot of people from in any category can really take that uh, approach as well. Um, ours is a little bit different because it's not, it's, it's very not aesthetics um, because you can't really see the suspension on a vehicle. So it really comes down to how does it feel? If you get that vehicle tall enough, then you can. <laughs> yeah. I think that's when you've done it right. You need that step ladder to get into it. SEMA builds with Bluetooth drive shafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, Having been to SEMA, nothing is crazier than like the F-250 builds that like they have to be outside because you can't realistically fit it into any interior space. You know, and they're like, well, it's roughly well, it's slightly taller than my house. You know, just completely absurd stuff. They're fun, though. I mean, the whole point is that it's absurd. You're like, look what I did, you know, really flex that engineering muscle for no reason other than look what I did. Still sleeping on your Black Friday sale? <laughs> me, 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 me then consider this your wake-up call. Download Zipify Pages so you don't miss the biggest payday of the year. Zipify Pages is a landing page builder created by the founder of a $180 million Shopify store. It is everything you need to launch your next promotion more quickly and for a lot more profit. With their library of proven templates, you can build a high-performing holiday funnel in just a few clicks, from Black Friday to New Year's and everything in between. And because every template is tested on their nine-figure Shopify store, you know they actually work. Plus, you can use Zipify pages to optimize your product pages, blog pages, and even your homepage, so your store is ready to convert more of that holiday traffic. So if you want to have your most profitable and stress-free holiday season ever, then go to zipify.com slash Kurt. That's Z-I-P-I-F-Y dot com slash K-U-R-T to start your 14-day free trial today. And to get an unadvertised gift, email help at zipify.com and ask for the holiday bonus. Um, okay, so on the educational content, like a lot of places do will do builds and you keep it more educational. It's like installation, overview, decision-making, pre-purchase decision-making, like a lot of that, but done without judgment, which is clever. And then, um, you know, some installation stuff, like how-to stuff. So I find educational content on YouTube works really well, especially for brands that have an inherently do-it-yourself component. So how do you get the ideas for this educational content? We, I mean, there's always new products coming out, always new vehicles coming out. Um, and so it, it's that, and, and in that regard, that kind of model has been like, is almost uh, written itself. Just the, just the model is almost evergreen because the new, you know, the new 
a brand new t Tacoma is coming out and the brand new Tacoma is going to have six or seven or 10 different shock absorbers that's going to be applied. It's going to be coming out for it. And so, you know, we're already planning um, what, what that looks like in a year or two as new options come out because everyone's going to be so hot on it. And so, uh, you know, we look at new applications, we look at, um, you know, and once you own that space on YouTube or in Google, you, you know, you just uh, benefit so much from uh, inherent SEO. Um, you just benefit at being top one through five um, on all those related search terms, you know, and YouTube, you know, YouTube, ever since the bookmarking, we, we treat a lot of our YouTube videos like a blog post, right? You bookmark the time, you timestamp the different sections and it's basically, it, it, you know, that's a huge SEO little trick as well. Um, and so we, the, the product side of things is very kind of that, that game plan is already kind of written itself. Well, we're trying to get a little bit more into lifestyle, which is more what I'm about, um, in terms of all the trails and all the different adventures and camping and destinations that we go to. But that's a, that's a little bit of a different, um, I, I would say audience that we're going after. And, um, you know, where we, where we li really live is, is, is being, you know, product, you know, product enthusiast and kind of specialist. That's, that's really where uh, our value is. Um, so. One thing I found with someone who has this much experience with automotive and YouTube, one thing I've noticed is in the comments on automotive social media, there is schoolyard gatekeeping at the level of like Sega versus Nintendo. And it is so strange because like, wait, no, we're all here for the same thing because we love automotive, but you guys are like so deep into it. You know, you, it, the commenters are like just fighting over the dumbest thing. And you alluded to it, but you're like, you know, there is some virality just to doing a comparison video in which you don't even seem to declare a winner. You're like, here's pros and cons. And they still are like, oh, no, this is the best shock because I own it. <laughs> you're invalidating my purchase. Yeah. Yeah, even after a long 30 minute, 20 or 30 minute video where we're trying to explain the pros and cons, people are still like, well, which one is the best? I'm like, you didn't get, you don't understand. <laughs> it's like, what do you want to do with the vehicle? What's your budget? Okay, that one is the best. These people can't figure it out for themselves. And there was recently some, um, some internal discussion about like, we have to give people less options <laughs> because it's like they enter analysis paralysis even when we're doing a good explanation of um all the products, people still want their handheld and told what what kind of decision to be made. Um, back to that word gatekeeping, though, that's that's another reason why I kind of got into this space, or maybe why I charge so hard into this space because of um, just the um, opaque nature of shock absorbers of technical product. You know, our our this industry is very much ran by gearheads and very polarizing in people uh, business approaches, and you know. These are some of these brands are like led from ex racers who used to race against this guy. And now there's always a rivalry. And if you ever run this, you'll never run that because of whatever, whatever, you know, all that stuff going down. And so now we have, you know, shops and um, motorsport places that, um, you know, they, they change little minute things in, in your shock absorber to make it feel a certain way, you know, literally just stacking metal pieces a little bit differently. And now, now they are professional tuners and everyone goes to them because they know how to do these little special things to the shock absorber. But those guys will never share that information. Um, and they'll, they'll never put it on a dyno graph to show you how it behaves. Um, they're very much, that's like the epitome of gatekeeping in, in, in this space. And so, um, the long-term goal is to democratize the, the learnings of how to do that yourself. Um, it seems very, um, esoteric and very like super nerdy, but the amount of people that are buying these extremely high end 2000, 5,000, $7,000 systems, and then don't have the ability, don't have the education, don't don't have the knowledge to be able to alter them yourselves when they're meant to be altered. That's that's where I see the uh, the big opportunity because um, teaching a man teaching a man a fish, right? Um, and so that kind of helps helps with the gatekeeping, helps democratizing the knowledge of how to do the thing. And that's that's all my ultimate goal. Right now, we do a lot of like very introductory level stuff. Um, I always call us we're not. We're not experts, 
um, we're more enthusiasts that like really learn by experience. We're not professional race car tuners. We're not professional racers at, at that very, very high level, but uh, we aim to kind of get there eventually and bring all of that knowledge down down the chain to the, to the average person they want to do it themselves. It's admirable and it will result in so many angry, stupid comments. Cause you're right. It's like they sell there. If you get really fancy, you could buy an adjustable shock, meaning you could change the rate at which it come. It opens and closes is would be the layman's explanation. And if you don't know what you're doing, you just wildly screw it up where it's like, I mean, I have no, I understand the concept. I'm never going to get that right. Given the option, I'd be like, give me the non-adjustable shocks. Save me from myself. I don't want to screw this up. And <laughs> I could, I've, I've been there. I've done this. I have really made a very uncomfortable to drive Subaru in my past. Trying to find info and get, you know, three people tell you three different things. And so like, okay, obviously education helped a lot here. You start this in 2012. Uh, by like 2016, we're on Shopify. 2019, we're doing three and a half million. Uh, then things go insane. I mean, you 10 x uh, since then in four years. How? How does one do that? I mean, just incredible growth. Yeah, we. I think we were very, very well positioned because the um, we were we're using Channel Advisor as a backend inventory management tool and an order tool, and I'd always seen Channel Advisor from my eBay days as like the the pinnacle of achievement to manage to like you know order management because what's the big thing when you're scaling when you're scaling something is automated tracking information back to the customer right and that was a big deal in the eBay days because you want to get your item shipped within 24 hours, better ratings and all that stuff. So we immediately had that set up um, in about 2018, 2019. Um, and so when COVID hit, we we were already showing things that were in stock or out of stock. You know, that was a big thing for us. Probably in a lot of industries, everything, you know, who had stock of stuff. And so well, I also- ordered, I mean, we in automotive, you know, we got hit by that, I think more so than others, where mm -hmm. it just- the inventory shortages are still happening today mm, and yeah. still recovering. We, um, so, and we had a really big network. I basically have, ha we, ha we have accounts at um, pretty much all the major distributors in North America. And that's a lot more than most of our competition. So most of our competition only has probably two or three uh, accounts. And we've got like 11. And so tied in with all those inventory, COVID hit, we're in stock. We're seeing massive, you know, ROAS on our on our campaigns. I'm just like, well, just keep spending because um, we're making money. Um, everyone's talking about out of stock. We're in stock, um, and at the same time, we had Facebook just um, branding campaigns, just running little quick 10, 15 second like action clips of a lot of our adventures. And so it was kind of the culmination of right place, right time. Um, a lot of preparation that we just got extremely lucky, and I feel extremely lucky because. Um, we, our first business in 2008, 2009 got crushed by the the, re, the first uh, recession or that recession. And so looking at COVID, it just deathly afraid, like what is going to happen? And then, you know, we pulled back ever so like hesitating on what to do next. And all of a sudden just massive, massive demand. Um, I mean, we did like, we did 10 days of Black Friday sales in a row in, in April, which was like, I don't understand what what's happening with the world right now. Um, and so that was, we found ourselves extremely fortunate at that point. And we held on to, you know, that played out, that played out in 2020, 2021, uh, 2022 is when ad, ad costs started going all janky. And, um, we learned some lessons there, lost some, lost a little bit of money there, um, recovered. And, um, we've, we've used financing tools like Shopify working capital as well. Um, mm -hmm because we don't, aren't fully drop ship. We, we do buy inventory. And so being able to use, you know, shop, Shopify capital to, to amplify that program where we can, we were also co cornering markets. Like we would, we know of a, a brand's triple, triple movers, triple a, a plus movers. We would corner all of those in the entire country for like one or two months. And so we'd be able to turn off ads, sell them at full margin and you know that benefited us as well not on, not necessarily on the money side of things but more on the authority side of things because when you when you're the only one with something you know you're basically you guarantee your your number one spot on google for for those searches and so we kind of arbitraged in a bunch of different areas over the past couple of years with uh 
this this demand um, that we that we saw. Ooh, inaccurate tracking. It's a silent profit killer. Every misdirected ad campaign, every misunderstood customer behavior, it's all money down the drain. But there's a fix. Elevar. It's your comprehensive tool to track and optimize all your conversions, making sure your marketing efforts aren't wasted. With Elevar, you get server-side tracking, boosted Klaviyo flow performance, and boosted meta performance. That's better data, more accurate targeting, and ultimately, more conversions. Join the ranks of over 6,500 successful D2C brands like Glossier, Viore, and Magic Spoon. They've all turbocharged their conversion tracking with Elevar. Data-driven decision-making requires solid data and insights. Don't let your competitors get ahead because you're stuck with insufficient data. Invest in Elevar now and make every marketing dollar count. Their plans start at $0 a month, and all plans include a 15-day free trial. Go to getelevar.com to get started. E-L-E-V-A-R, Elevar. Hindsight being 2020, this just seems like such a, a brilliant move. At the time, it would have felt risky. But so what you did, you had, you're doing drop shipping, but you are fully integrated with your warehouse distributors. You're using Channel Advisor. That's our middleware. And that's both going to route orders to the correct place, whoever has it in stock, but also sync the inventory back into Shopify. And so in real time, you're able to, well, like within hours, real time, you're going to able to show live inventory at a time when everyone is worried about, do you actually have this? At a time where we unintentionally educated consumers on this is what drop shipping is, right? People are now much more sophisticated than in 2019. And so they understood, ah, okay, if they say it's, if yeah, I've got a website that shows me stock status where some things are out of stock, some things are in stock, then they probably actually do have it. And so they were much more willing to order from you because like, in this space, you have people who they know what they want. They could just search a, a SKU, a manufacturer part number, and then see in Google Shopping results, here's who has it, and then order. And then you get the cancellation email where you're like, wait, I thought, I thought it was in stock, right? And so the site that can very clearly demonstrate, yes, we actually have stuff in stock, is the, is the one you order from, plus you know, the authority, the educational, plus everything else. But I think you're right. I think that became, since 2020, I think that if you're drop shipping, real-time stock status becomes table stakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, most of our industry was on the other side of things, which is just like, we have this available and if, you, if you're buying it, then you're okay with whatever waiting, waiting time there is. But um, with, you know, with COVID happening, tons of people just going outside and spending money on, on parts for their vehicle, because that's the only thing you could you could do. I think it really crushed our competition with just customer service issues because yes. people were like, you know, people that are used to going buying on Amazon be like, it's in stock. I'm going to get it the following day. We're now buying from these shops and these, these motorsport companies where like they thought it was in stock um, and then waiting a week. And these motorsport companies don't even understand the need of that customer. And so now they're like crushed by all these phones. They're like, they're making money, but then they're also refunding half those orders because those customers are waiting a waiting around. And so, you know, our customers, those, those guys were getting crushed by customer service, looking to us, pretending like we had it easy. Um, <laughs> and we're like, no, we, we prepared for, we were prepared for this moment. Um, and the, the drop shipping thing is so interesting because it's been happening in retail for a long time, but even in the automotive space, there's still so much opportunity because so many of these big garage sites, I, I call them garage sites cause they sell, they sell everything. Um, they're ran by, you know, um, older generation, um, maybe some people that figured out the drop shipping really, really, really early. Um, you know, right now we, us and, you know, other big, big guys like, um, you know, auto, auto, anything went out of business, car ID went out of business. These guys are all dying from a thousand cuts because it's so easy to get into this space. And, and if they you're were listening, huge, absolutely. They were huge. The, like 10 years ago, the idea of them just collapsing under their own weight and inability to get inventory would have been unthinkable. Uh, Auto Anything was my, like not inspiration, uh, kind of my inspiration. I looked to their site, like we were going to have a site like Auto Anything someday uh, because they, you know, I always thought of them as like the, you know, they, they were just a stellar, a stellar company um, in the late 2010s. Right. Um, but yeah, if you're listening to this, there's still so much opportunity in the smaller categories of the automotive space. Um, because of the education, um, 
these giant garage sites have no special specialty of like their customer their customer service has no specialty, right? They're just they're just you're just an order. They're, you want to return, you want an exchange, what is it, right? They don't know how to get you into something that'll work. All these things kind of play a part in um, gaining authority and, and and building a business. So I think you know if you were to try it today, mm-hmm. the mistake is try is addressing the entire market. Especially, you know, and even like if you're doing aftermarket and you're saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to address all of aftermarket. Well, if your idea is to cast a wider net, do all replacement parts because replacement parts, that's like a hundred X the size of aftermarket. But the reality is you're just making it harder and harder on yourself. And so, you know, you focused on a single product type within the aftermarket automotive shocks. And it seems like it, it tends to get lean toward off-road. And so like that's slicing it a little thinner. And even then, you know, you still have 78,000 pages indexed in Google. So you see we're like going too wide. You just make a, a really difficult to manage site. You know, one of the most successful sites I worked on, it sold only tuners for diesel trucks. That was it. And because they're like, we have this and this is what will fit your vehicle. They were able to succeed at that. And, and, and then you're able to make your, and then you're able to make your product, your, your product pages um, are all tailored to the the diesel the diesel tuning product, right? You can have a dynograph on that, or you can have an air filter kind of comparison chart, right? That's the benefit of you know we've seen where you're, when you're able to make your product description page, your PDP speak specifically to your category, and not have to worry about also talking about an air filter or talking about wheels and tires and all of that other stuff, right? Oh man, wheels and tires. If you want to pick the most complicated category there, do wheels and tires. It's just like everything has 10 different specs to it, and it, but it'll fit all kinds of different fitments unless they have this one package. Oh my gosh. We built one of these, wheelwiz, wheelwiz.canada.ca. What a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, it's product information management's nuts. Yeah. I, I, there, there's a lot of horror stories of PIMs, um, people really uh, eating their shorts on developing their own PIMs. Um, product information management systems. Yeah, product information management. When you're in drop shipping and you have a huge catalog and it's technical like this, and then you add all the fitments to it, it's very hard. How do you manage it? With that, I assume that you've torn all of your hair out. I see you still have your eyebrows though. You could pull those. <laughs> I was blessed. Um, we we clean tons of our data and um, back to the gatekeeping. A lot of these brands, they don't, they don't even the, the guys developing the, the Excel files regarding their product, they're like, oh, it doesn't matter if it's for two two wheel drive or four wheel drive for this application, like just look at the product specs and you should know. Like, no, no consumer knows that the top mount on the four wheel drive needs a stem and the two wheel drive needs the eyelet. So use this other part number. So these guys are the reason why we have a business because we we demystified all this 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 nuance that the, the general customer doesn't know. There's still cut businesses, there's still brands in this business that don't want to give you a shop link because they're like, uh, we're not going to tell you they're only usable for our kits and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we clean a lot of data. Um, my, my product manager, um, Ryan, he's, he's a data scientist trained at Cornell. And so, you know, I kind of discovered his expertise to help us out really early on. And so basically a cus- we have a custom system that all the stuff kind of pipeline goes through and fitment apps and all of that whole side of things we've kind of built in house almost by accident. I don't really like. You really illustrated the challenge here to manage (laughs) product information for selling just shocks. You have a data scientist from Cornell build a custom solution. That's how you did it. Pretty much. Yeah. That's why this (laughs) is so hard to do right. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, it's almost by accident because, you know, now me and him, we talk to all these companies and, um, you know, they're, they're like bouncing ideas off us or bouncing our ideas off him because like, we're so deep in it. Not, not only from like a product basis and an enthusiast basis, but we actually have like the, the technology chops, um, to back it all up. And so, um, you know, we've just, yeah, back to being prepared for, for the moment, you know, we've, we've been real lucky and it just all out of a, all out of a, you know, a genuine, you know, excitement for building this big of a brand um, and also excitement for, you know, what's, what's ahead and just being able to help more people. 
10x revenue in four years, that also means you need to really scale your team. What were those challenges like? I think we're a little bit behind on that one. Um, we've only got about 15 people right now, um, but it was, you know, more, more cu hiring customer service and finding enthusiasts that aren't going to, that are really going to, the, the whole idea of this is culture fit. You know, the, people have been talking about this for the past year now or so, year or two with culture, COVID, you know, people not in the office. Our team, uh, big ups to my team. I love them so much. They wanted to come back to the office as soon as possible when COVID hit because everyone really jives together and the energy really it helps to, it all helped each other out. Um, but we, we have a couple remote employees, um, and we have some people overseas helping with customer service as well. Um, but the bulk of our team is in LA. I think we got 10 or 11 people there now, and they're all enthusiasts. We all go camping together. Um, people go out for drinks together. We're all pretty young. Um, there are some gearheads. Um, everyone has like their own vehicles. You usually, we've had a number of people get hired with cars, sell their cars, and get trucks or jeeps <laughs> because thought they want to join us on the trips. Um, and so it's very much that kind of culture. We're all pretty young, um, tech tech oriented, um, and it's it's been a we've had we've had we haven't had too much fallout, um, but still a small team and uh, we're we, we've used this year as kind of a don't grow let's solidify reevaluate re um you know to continue building the foundation um for the next phase of growth um and that's not in just like business economics or kpis or anything like that like margin but it's also building building the people here training them more building them up as you know leaders where i can so it's it's been a big challenge in, in that regard um because I don't, I don't remember who said it but people you know people build companies you you don't just build a big company on your own right so um yeah it's been it's been good and um challenging but i you know i think rewarding for a lot a lot of our team yeah like many people you found yourself in your niche, right? You were just exposed to it and then saw the opportunity and ran with it. What advice would you give someone trying to find their own niche or niche? If I'm saying it appropriately. I like niche better. I'm sorry. Yeah, I like niche also. This is America. It's uh, niche. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. There, it is a, it, it, it does feel cliche, um, right? When we're talking about passion or whatnot, but my passion before was like throwing stuff in my truck, throwing my tent in my truck and um, throwing my bike in my truck and just go camping for the weekend up in the Kern River or somewhere. And um, when I got into kind of the off-road space, I was like, oh, well, you know, I do this and I can use these products. Um, so let's just go discover more about it. But it, if I wasn't in this, I'd probably be making a beach volleyball app or something because I play a lot of beach volleyball or I'd be um, discovering some better running shoe because I do a lot of um, I do a lot of trail runs and, and uh, running races or whatnot. Uh, I, it, right now is I can't say it enough, but right now is the time for everybody to really think about what they love to do, what they would do if they didn't get paid to do it, um, and just go start talking about it on TikTok. Like we haven't even talked about TikTok or Instagram and the whole arbitrage of education there. Because right now it's like everyone's kind of just entertaining and very junk junk food junk food content on Instagram, right? Oh, yeah, um, snack sized. <laughs> yeah, um, but on TikTok, education educating in your space or edu um, educating in your um, just your what you're excited about has massive massive opportunity. Um, so even in the automotive space, there's opportunity for people that are that love their Chevy truck. Um, but this plays out in all aspects, right? Where all these big companies, they're all dying by a million cuts because small creators are building a brand around their interest and in then maybe maybe using an existing product or they're developing their own product. Um, and so I, I don't know how to go about doing that, but really think what if you can just run a camera on what you like to do on the weekend, like what would that be? Um, start exercising that just a little bit more. And if you get excited about it, then like that is a, a signal to, to keep going. And that's such good advice. And for existing Shopify merchants, any one piece of advice for them? 
Yeah, um, I got a lot of advice there. You know, roll your con, roll all this content. You know, if you aren't doing content, start doing education content. And if you are, roll that into email flows. If you have an email system, like the, we do, we do about 20, 25% of our revenue through email. And that's, you know, Clavio reported email. But um, I, I find so many businesses, not even the automotive space, but every space, they are, they are not having a follow up email campaign. They have no welcome campaign with, you know, five or six emails. Me and you are, this is like, seems super obvious for us because we're in this space, but the small businesses still aren't doing the thing where they also, they're worried, you know, they're doing less in revenue, but they aren't doing these small things that are extremely obvious. Setting up a newsletter or re regular delivery of the content that is coming out to, you know, that you guys are developing. Show that to everyone that has shown interest to you. Um, that's been, I think, the content side of things is is really what has been able to set us apart. We have so much fresh content going out to our email all the time. How often are you sending those emails? We've got, I mean, I think we probably send out 12, 10, probably 10 or 12 campaigns a month, um, usually always on new product uh, reviews, uh, releases, uh, head to heads. Uh, and then we have a welcome, we have a welcome flow that delivers five emails based on your preferences of whether you've got like a, a heavy duty truck or you're off-roading or you're you got a car. So heavy segmentation on the emails. Um, I think we sometimes send too many emails, uh, but the, the, the thing is, is like the revenue, the revenue always goes up with more emails we send. So it's, it's hard as a business owner in this retail ward to like pull that back when it is producing money. Um, but email is, has, I think it's one of the still untapped things that a lot of small businesses are not doing. Um, with their, with their customer base, especially now with customer acquisition costs going going way up how do you get more out of your existor out of your existing customers you know i was talking to a friend um that has a, a massage practice and you know for the past couple of years he's like i'm so busy i'm so busy and i'm like that's great that's great and then now it's like not so busy i'm like did you get moving on that email program yet and he's like uh no not yet but yet at the same time he's talking to me about how to market to get more customers in the door i'm like I'm like you've never sent me an email and I would pay way more for not only this service, but any other service you might have to take care of my body. So it's still lost on the, a, a lot of small businesses that, you know, how much more you can get out of an existing customer. Lifetime value is our biggest focus for the next couple of years. I think that's, I think that's brilliant advice. I, you're absolutely right. right. Sean, before we sign off, where could people learn more about you? Um, shock surplus everywhere. Um, we're also shock boss on TikTok. I'm doing massive amount of um, question and answer over there uh, with videos. That's our that's our newest thing is kind of um, showing showing answers with with, with experience. Um, so shock surplus on YouTube, dot com, Instagram, shock boss on TikTok. Beautiful, Sean. This has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fred. I really appreciate the time. The unofficial Shopify podcast is brought to you by Loop. Loop is a returns management platform that makes returns profitable and stress-free for you and your shoppers. Loop offers automated returns, exchanges, and store credit options to lower costs and increase revenue. Do you want to offer at-home pickup or boxless drop-offs? Need to lower return costs or increase repeat purchases? How about all of the above? That's what's possible with Loop. Loop delivers customized returns management solutions for Shopify merchants of all sizes, like studs, Princess Polly, code epoxy to turn returns into returning customers find out why thousands of shopify merchants choose loop to manage their returns at loopreturns.com that's loopreturns.com